So hi, this is Lynn Mayo from Repicture. And today we're gonna to be talking about transportation engineering careers. We're really excited we have with us Michael Gifford. Mike is a project manager at RK and K and he has about 12 years experience as a transportation engineer. So Michael, thanks for, for joining us. And just first of all, can you just introduce uh, RK and K and say a little about RK and K? Absolutely, thanks for having me, Lynn. I'm glad to be here and helping you all out and having this discussion. Um, RKNK is a uh, full service planning, engineering, environmental, and construction management company. Uh, we're focused in the mid Atlantic and southeastern US with uh, offices in 11 states plus DC and about 1,500 employees. Um, our goal is to really provide all engineering services that our clients might need. Great. And actually, I just want to say, I know RK and K, I talked to one of your interns that you had, some are interns, engineer intern, and you have a great program for interns. Um, so I want to give a shout out to the company for that, that great program you have for your for summer engineering interns. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah. So our topic today is talk about transportation engineer, and it's such a broad topic. And I was hoping you can just talk a little about, you know, what is transportation engineering? What are the some of the disciplines under transportation engineering? Happy to. So yeah, as you mentioned, transportation engineering itself is a very broad uh, category. In it, you have all sorts of different uh, types of disciplines. My focus personally is on roadway engineering. So I do roadway design, which is really where the roads are, how they're aligned, um, travel lanes, all of that. But also we focus on things such as sidewalks and bike and pedestrian facilities and really anything, anything within the uh, the right of way, um, the government property from uh, along the roadway. Um, besides that, there are other types of tra transportation engineers, such as uh, traffic engineering is another one of the big ones. There they look at everything from planning, future roadways, policies. Um, they'll do modeling on what current conditions look like, what potential future conditions look like. Uh, they'll take different concepts and really see how that'll affect traffic and uh, pedestrian and bicycle use in present and in the future if they're implemented. Um, and then you also have the traffic engineering design side, which includes doing things such as signal designs, lighting, uh, really kind of more of the operations in the day-to-day uh, -day of how, um, how the infrastructure is really put in. Um, and then, of course, you also have structural engineering. So you will have bridges and uh, culverts to get streams across streets. So it really touches on within those, just a few of those are some very broad categories of uh, the transportation engineering. That's great. And like you said, it's just amazing how many different things are covered in there. Um, so like what kind of projects, and we talked about roadway design, but like what kind of projects do transportation engineers work on? So most of my projects, uh, they're actually a pretty large range. Um, right now I'm working on two projects within DC that are actually looking at redesigning uh, corridors. One is on Connecticut Avenue, um, just north of DuPont Circle. So it's a very heavy, heavily traveled road. Uh, one of the busiest in in the DC area and we're looking at changing the roadway configuration to provide um, better pedestrian and bike access while continuing to provide the travel lanes for vehicles. So it's really just looking at going through redeveloping the area including like I mentioned new streetscape and all of that to kind of beautify the area a little bit but also then keeping up operations for all users. Um, so there's you can have projects like that. Um, another project that I'm working on right now is the uh, is out in Route 66, so west of DC, um, where we're look, working at the I-66 and Nutley interchange. So here it is a massive interstate interchange uh, where we're doing a completely new reconfiguration of the interchange as part of an even larger project that's uh, redoing I think it's, uh, well, I think it's like 20 miles of I-66 to add in toll lanes. So you have some of the Connecticut avenues which are a little more local projects and then you have some of these more big interstate projects where you're really dealing with large highways. Uh, that's interesting and I love the fact for those local ones that you're looking at the bicyclists and the pedestrians and things like that so it's not just cars you know involved in transportation engineering. 
Yeah, and actually a couple of the other projects that I've been involved in um, in the area have actually just had a sole focus on bicycle and pedestrian improvements where uh, the municip municipality I was working with had funding just for those. So we would be looking at creating, um, one of them was out in Silver Spring, it was creating a whole bike and pedestrian priority area where we'd be looking to make sure that there were bike connections throughout to get people um, on bikes to wherever they needed, and then also to include a lot of intersection safety improvements for pedestrians to inter increase safety for pedestrians crossing the roads and make sure that they had those connections as well. So that if you were walking along a sidewalk, it didn't all of a sudden just end. You had somewhere where you were, you could connect to wherever you were getting or going. That's great. And so with the transportation project such as that, there are probably a lot of different people involved. What, what did transportation engineers do on those projects? Great question. Um, so it really just depends on the project and where it is in the life cycle. Um, towards the beginning of the project, I know on the roadway design side, what we do a lot of is looking at the corridor and laying out where the best situation for the road is. Um, so we're looking at, and it depends a little bit on if it's a brand new road, if you have like if we're putting a new road through a field, it's a little different than if we're redoing an existing road. Most of the work that we really are doing is a reconstruction of an existing road. So we have kind of where the road is already laid out, but then we have to look at what the different uses are going to be, working with our traffic engineers to figure out how many lanes are needed, how many, um, working with the um, municipality that we're working with to determine what type of pedestrian and bike facilities should be along those roadways. And then once we get kind of each of the different elements of what the road, roadway should all entail, we then go through and kind of lay it out to create a concept, make sure that it is, meets all the requirements um, of both the national standards and the local standards. And to um, most of which are, I mean, we start off with the roadway requirements, which are largely making sure that drivers experience a smooth drive through the roadway, um, making sure that they can do it at the appropriate speeds and hopefully not too fast either. Um, and then also then going from there, checking to make sure that we are doing thing, uh, the sidewalks and all meet ADA compliance, um, that we are having those bike connections through, that we are actually creating a system that's going to work for everyone. So we kind of lay that out uh, to create a concept or multiple concepts depending on what's happening in the corridor. And then once a uh, concept is selected, then we actually go, to go through and go more through the details of it. So uh, with, with roadway engineers, we look at, once again, I say the alignment, so really the horizontal alignment where the road goes through the corridor. And then we also look at vertical to make sure that the profile of the road is smooth, meets the requirements for all of the vertical curves as well. Um, and then we do kind of more fine graining, uh, grading around um, each of the intersections, ensuring smooth connections, like I mentioned before, ADA compliance for sidewalks, all of those to really get into the details um, of how everything connects, that it's constructible, and that we end up then with a uh, fully designed usable facility. Uh, that's a great explanation, and I love your term. Um, ex I forget what you said exactly, the acceptable design speed or <laughs> appropriate speed. So yep. hopefully get not, people not going too slow, but also not going too fast. So makes a lot right. of sense. Yeah, no, that is uh, one of the big things that's kind of a push in the industry right now is looking at target speeds so that we instead of, uh, normally we design to a design speed. So it's everything has to meet that minimum design speed but we don't look too much at um, what the maximum speed somebody could drive through a corridor is. Now it's starting to change that we're looking at to improve safety, bringing down some of those top speeds, doing traffic coming through corridors to really get everyone so that it's a more consistent speed through to create a safer environment. Yeah, yeah, that's really important, especially in those urban areas, that's really important. So that's a kind of good um, overview of, of what transportation engineers do. As far as like a typical day at work, and I recognize that's a challenging question, but what would 
you know, typical um, transportation engineer, maybe early in their career, what would they do on a typical day versus later in their career like yourself? You know, what type of things you do on a typical day? Okay, yeah. Um, early on in your career, you kind of are dealing a lot with the day-to-day. Uh, the -day. It's singular design. You'll be looking at kind of one project um, going through and digging into the design of one aspect. Um, it could be creating a graphic for one of the concepts um, or I know a lot of in my early years, it was a lot of uh, doing drainage design. So I would end up having to do the drainage calculations, laying out drainage areas, um, inlet calculations for uh, the water to get in the uh, storm drain system and then pipe calculations for how it gets through. Um, so it'd be a lot of that, a lot of, um, I mean, it's not the most fun thing, but checking uh, grades and uh, slopes to make sure that we are meeting ADA compliance on sidewalks, uh, designing a lot of curb ramps, because uh, you may see curb ramps on the sidewalk, but what you don't realize is that the design that goes into those is every single point on them has a very specific elevation. So that way we make sure that it is an accessible ramp. So um, it meets the requirements and is usable. Uh, so it's a lot of working on the fine details of that. Um, normally early on, I mean, it depends on what projects you're on a little bit, but if you are on a large project, you will kind of have just that project that you're working on. So you get to know in one project very, very well. You also may at times have a bunch of little projects, um, in which you're doing pieces here and there of. So it can kind of vary a lot depending on uh, what projects you're working on and what opportunities you have. Okay, great. You mentioned ADA. What, what is ADA? Oh, sorry, yes. Um, it's the American Disabilities Act. And so that's um, to make sure that all people are able to use the facilities, that even if they have um, a disability, that they are able to um, use, uh, use the facilities. So like I mentioned with the um, curb ramps, they are designed so that way people in wheelchairs can use them. The people who might have um, impaired vision, um, their detectable warning surfaces that they can pick up with their canes. Uh, when we do traffic signal design, there'll be um, audible uh, pedestrian signals that alert them to not only when the light, or when it's safe for them to cross, but also alert them which directions to cross. So it's really just looking at all of the uh, infrastructure pieces to make sure that it is usable for all users. Yeah, so it's important work to keep keep everyone safe. Yes. So, so you talked about kind of in the, your early years, you maybe do a lot on one big project or you know do do parts on on smaller projects. When after you have 10, 12 years or more experience, what what's your typical day like for you? What's your typical day like now? So my day now, um, I'm managing a couple of different projects. So it kind of is a lot of uh, checking in on everyone and what's happening with each of the projects. So um, as we mentioned before with transportation engineering, we have all of those different specialties from uh, traffic and structures. And, but then we also have people working on our projects for environmental resources, um, water resources, landscape architecture, utility coordination. Uh, we have surveyors on it. So I actually end up um, with most of my projects checking in to see what the status of each of the different things is, um, each of the different disciplines, where they are at with their design. Um, I still am very heavily involved in the roadway design side of things. So um, overseeing the roadway engineers that are working on the project, but also jumping in and doing um, some of that work as well. Um, and yeah, and then also um, as you move up further and further, you spend more time also working on business development and trying to bring in new works, new projects, and being aware of what's out there and where the industry is continuing to go. Uh, that, that's interesting. So basically, the beginning of the career, it's maybe very focused in a different area, but by the time you get to your level, you're really involved in all different types of of engineering, engineering projects, and transportation. 
But what type of, for, for the younger people, what would they, t how much time would they typically spend out in the field versus the office if they were a, a transportation engineer? So I think it kind of depends a little bit on uh, which type of transportation engineer um, you are. Because I know uh, some of our structural people spend a little more time out in the field because they'll do, be doing inspection of existing structures that are out there. Um, so I know, once again, for me, I'll just kind of talk a little more from the roadway side of it. Um, on roadway, we don't spend too much time out in the field. Uh, we'll do initial assessments um, out in the field because kind of the, with the design process, we end up getting a survey and you kind of take a look at that and lay out or on GIS information. Uh, you lay out where the roadway are is going to be, what the features are going to be, all of that. Um, but a lot of times, you can't really get the feel of what the project look like looks like until you're out in the field and really get a get a feel of what the existing conditions are. Um, so almost every single one of my projects, I've gone out to the field at some point to walk it, make sure that I agree with what was surveyed, agree with the recommendations that we're making through the corridor, um, see if there's anything out there that we may have missed that would change our design. Um, so it's kind of spot site visits here and there a few times through the design process, but uh, most of the work that we do is really in the office, kind of more of the desk. Okay, great. So Mike, what's have been your favorite project? So I knew you were going to ask me this, and I was having a really hard time coming up with an answer for it. Um, kind of throughout my career, I feel like I've had a number of different ones. Um, there are a couple that I would qualify as being the most proud to be involved in, which um, kind of, uh, I was involved in the roadway design portion of the wharf development here in DC, which was just a very massive project. I actually forget how much it was at this point. but. Um, but one of those where I got to do the road, uh, the redesign of the roadway right in front of that. Um, in every aspect from looking at some of the drainage to designing all of the traffic signals to um, doing all of the curb placement and throughout the whole corridor. So that was uh, one that comes to mind. Um, but really kind of right now, I'm, I'm almost always excited for what my current and next project are going to be. So uh, as I mentioned right now, I'm working on the Connecticut Avenue project, which to me is the, one of the most exciting that I've worked on just because we are looking at changing kind of the nature of a major arterial through DC. And then we're also looking at providing a, uh, a new structure to serve as a plaza, a pedestrian plaza for, um, for people right by DuPont Circle. So one of the very heavily uh, most heavy pedestrian areas in DC. That, that's really interesting. I didn't know you worked on the Wharf project. I mean, that's a great project, like you said. Actually, I encourage people to go to repicture.com, Google the Wharf, and we actually have a number of project write-ups about it. We don't think on transportation yet, so maybe we can get, get you on that, but that is um, that is just one, probably one once in a lifetime or once in a career type type project. So it's great you worked on it. So if students were interested in getting into transportation engineer, you know, I assume, um, like you, they should be a civil engineer. Um, but what, what courses, in addition to like a transportation engineering course, what courses do you think would be helpful for them to take? Yeah, so as you mentioned, the transportation engineering courses would be at the top of the list. Any of the times that they have any traffic engineering, it's really helpful to understand any of the traffic modeling and Kind of the decision making that goes into modeling and planning um, and those aspects of it. Um, public policy courses, if there's any related to transportation. Um, also, oddly enough, um, or I guess not oddly enough, but it's one of those that I hadn't realized early on how much zoning actually in property uses goes into the transportation design um, for public facilities. Um, so, kind of some of those public policy aspects actually are really helpful for figuring out kind of the future of roadways, where things are going to go, um, and actually what the future priorities of uh, different land uses are. So that would be another suggestion. And then really almost any civil engineering course, 
out there is going to be helpful in some way. Um, as it's come up a couple times, our projects really just touch on everything. So having a base understanding of the water resources design, um, structures design, any of those, it really just helps to understand what the other disciplines are looking at. Um, and so you can relate to them and also make sure that you're providing them with what they need and that you're getting back really what you need. Yeah, it's interesting. So even if you don't directly use, say, a structures class, it's still, it, it's useful to have a structures background. So when you talk to those people, you can. Absolutely. Um, I actually was working a few months ago on a project that was uh, structures based. So the main design was for this very large bridge. Um, I was in charge of the roadway design on each, each of the approaches and kind of the connections into the existing streets. But being in those meetings um, and really under the knowledge that I knew about structural engineering really allowed me to talk to the bridge engineers and make sure that with the alignments that we were providing them with all the information that they needed from the geotech engineers, um, kind of that, out, that there was a good exchange of information just based off of us having some of the common knowledge of what each of the other disciplines was looking at. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And that, that's really interesting because not only, you know, structures, water, all those things that maybe say, oh, I'm not gonna meet, I'm not gonna get a job in that. Um, if you go into transportation engineering, you're going to need to know the water, you're going to need to know the construction management, all that. So that's a great, great um, point and great motivation for people to pay attention to those classes, even if you are going to be going to transportation engineering. Um, so is there a certain software, if you want to go into transportation engineering, is there like a certain software or different softwares that you most have to use that you encourage people to, to learn? Yes. So. Um... I know most civil engineering is done in AutoCAD as far as a design software. That is not the case for transportation engineering. Most of uh, transportation engineering ends up being done in MicroStation. Um, and then with, within MicroStation, there's a 3D modeling platform called OpenRoads. That seems to be the new one that all the, uh, all the clients are moving towards. So those, that would be my suggestion as far as um, trans or roadway design software. Um, and then as far as, uh, not that I'll get it too much into it, because I, once again, not a traffic engineer and don't want to get things wrong, but um, it does seem like there are, there's a number of different traffic modeling softwares uh, from Synchro to uh, Vism. And um, so there's different models that are out there that uh, if you're going into traffic engineering, you, you'll end up needing to learn how to use those. Okay, great. And how about technical writing? Has that been important for your career? Technical writing, yes, has been very important. Um, almost any project that we do, we'll end up having um, technical memos that we'll be writing, uh, whether it's to um, justify our designs. Uh, one of the projects that I'm actually working on right now, one of the things that I'm doing for it is writing design waivers and design exceptions. So it's a justification for the design that we are providing where we cannot meet whatever the um, provided standards are. So we have to look at what the standard is um, and if we can't meet it due to some existing condition or some other requirement, we have to provide a technical memo laying out everything from how we went through the design process to the justifications for why we can't meet it um, to alternatives and then also how we can mitigate um, mitigate any safety hazards that might be created from that. So it really is one of those where we are creating this technical memo where our writing, our technical writing and being persuasive through it is very important um, in order to get them approved. So that's just one example. Um, a lot of our other projects, we do end up writing memos, whether it be recommendations or um, recommendations for things like safety improvements through a corridor or an analysis of different alternatives. So with each of those, it's really important to have good writing skills. So these writing skills are important. How about communication as far as like public speaking? Have you had to do much of that in your career? Yes, uh, public speaking is incredibly important. Um, and 
It's one of those skills too that the more you advance in the industry, the more you end up using it. Um, a lot of our work is won through quality based selection. So it's actually, we put in a proposal that really lays out what our qualifications are, but then most clients bring us in to do an interview for that project if we want to, uh, if we want to win it. And so obviously we need to win it to then be able to work on that project. So with those, uh, we end up presenting in front of clients what our ideas are, what our approach for the project is. And so um, public presenting to, the, to them is really important. Um, and then also with our projects, most of them have a uh, public outreach element to them. So we end up giving presentations to the public about the designs, about what will be happening, um, about the designs, where, how they're being developed, what decisions we're making, how it's going to change. Uh, a lot of times the roadway that's in front of their house or a roadway that they use regularly. Um, and then we'll have more updates again once we actually reach construction to keep the public aware of the progress of it, um, what to expect, especially if there's lane closures or anything like that. Uh, just to keep them aware of how things are progressing, um, really just the more public outreach you do on those and the more informed the public is, the smoother your projects tend to go. So yeah, you need to be able to present or to do public presenting for any of those instances. Yeah, so it sounds like as an engineer, you need to be able to write, you need to do the presentation, obviously the technical stuff, we talk about the software and some of the classes. Are there any other skills that you think are important for a transportation engineer? I think the biggest one really is just problem solving. Um, with any of your projects, and I know I've noticed this through, throughout my work history, you never know what's going to come up. So it's going to be something different on every project that creates a new situation that you have to look at and really figure out how to best approach it and then come up with a solution or, or a number of solutions and then turn around and then communicate those to whoever the decision making um, people are to get, make sure that you get buy-in on whatever the best solution is. So it's kind of it, both problem solving and then commuting, communicating what, uh, what the solutions are and what the trade-offs of each of them is. That's great. And that's hopefully the engineering education is helping them right with those problem solving. You may not realize it, but getting those, those skills down. So if, um, if someone wanted to go into transportation engineering, and I know everyone's experiences are gonna be different and every job will be different, but how important do you think it is to have a master's in transportation engineering? Good question. Um, so I think it really depends on the person and kind of what they're looking at. Um, a lot of what I do from day to day is really applying what I learned in college. It's not necessarily looking at what the equations are or recalculating ways to do it. It's really just taking that equation and you apply it. But when I took my uh, professional engineering exam, I noticed that a lot of the things that I did as far as uh, roadway design, where I was relying on our design software to just calculate things for me, I knew less of how it was actually calculated um, until I went to take that exam and was starting to study for it. So I actually learned a bunch from studying for that exam of about the theoretical behind what I apply every day. So I think as far as a master's, there is some of that where um, you will end up getting a little more into the theoretical and less into the way that it's applied, which can be very, very useful. And it definitely is showing an interest in that area and you can become much more of an expert in that area. But I would also say that it's not necessarily needed. Yeah, that, that, that's really interesting idea. Um, Cause I know what I've kind of seen as computers come more and more, you know, standardized and more elaborate when they can do, sometimes it seems like less important to understand that theory until something goes wrong or there's some problem. And then to really understand that theory is, is really important. Yeah, I agree with that a lot. Um, most of the time, like I said, we're just applying things. However, you also need the theory to be able to go back 
if something goes wrong, or even to just back check things to make sure that it is being applied correctly. Um, I know a number of times I've gone through and we'll do a design and something just doesn't look right about it. And as a result, we'll go back through and do all the calculations by hand for that area just to confirm it. And oftentimes we find out something was being applied not quite correctly. Yeah, oh, interesting, that's really interesting. Now, you actually worked for about 10 years um, as a transportation engineer and then decided to get your MBA. So just yes. curious um, why you decided to get your MBA and, and how that's helped you. Yeah, so um, getting an MBA was something that I'd been interested in for a number of years, actually kind of probably coming out of college a couple of years into my career, I kind of thought that it was something that I'd be interested in. Um, I'm really interested in the business side of, uh, of the industry. Um, as much as I enjoy doing the engineering and all, I wanted to make sure that I had a really good fundamental understanding of that side of the industry as well. Uh, so that was part of the interest for me. Um, and then clearly I took a number of years before I really decided that that was the right move for me. Um, and as far as how it's been helping me, it really has given me a different viewpoint on some of the aspects of managing a project uh, from things like how important it is to get invoices out and get kind of do some of the administrative things that are a little less of delivering the project, but more for keeping the, helping keep your company financially sound and really making sure that, that our company, yeah, is financially sound and can be around to continue to help the clients. Which is important, right? We need to we need to get paid for the work we're doing um, in order to can continue. So so that's great that you have really that mix of the technical as well as the business business background. So if someone um, say it was a civil engineer who's been working in a different field for a couple years and listening to you right now, going that sounds really interesting what 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 you're doing and wanted to get into transportation engineer, but maybe they're in one of the other other fields. Um, it, it would be easy to switch over and any recommendations of what they could do to maybe make that type of transition easier? So yeah, I think it would be uh, pretty easy to switch over. As I mentioned, most of our projects touch on almost every single one of the other aspects of civil engineering. As a result, um, you can, I know from my past experience with our project, we pull in people from all the other uh, disciplines at different times, depending on what's happening on the project. So that is one way that you can uh, start to make the transition would be if you can get involved in that as uh, your aspect or where your expertise is um, in one of the transportation projects would be the, an easy way to make a first step. Um, as I mentioned before, the software is a big thing, um, especially for roadway design. If you know MicroStation, it's very easy to teach the rest of it. Um, so learn more or learn MicroStation, learn whatever software packages uh, that you're seeing the transportation engineers in the field that you want to move in to using. Now that's great advice. That, that, that's fantastic for people to, whether on their own or take a class and that software, it sounds like it makes it valuable for, for getting hired. Yeah, I think that that is one of those that it's the longest lead time as far as teaching someone. Um, the technical side of things, as long as people have kind of the engineering mindset, it's pretty easy to teach those. There's manuals out there that, I mean, we have our reference manuals, which are what we follow and kind of a, a lot of them end up laying out kind of the steps through which we go through design. Um, while there would be for the software similar manuals that lay out each of the steps and how you do them, it definitely is um, something that's a little harder, I feel like, to learn from a book and much more that you learn from just doing. Interesting. That's great. So what do you think has been the best part about being a transportation engineer? So the best part that I find is um, really getting to see my projects built. Uh, that's kind of the most rewarding. Um, one of the things about transportation projects is a lot of them have very long, long life cycles. 
So, um, I mean, there's been projects even that at the beginning of my career, I worked on designing that have still not been built. So that, I mean, it's been 12 years. Some of them end up getting shelved or priorities change within the, uh, um, within the communities in between times. So sometimes they don't end up ever being built. But when you do have the ones that are built, it's really, really satisfying. So as I mentioned with the wharf, every time I drive through Main Avenue down there, I just kind of feel a sense of pride. Um, and then there's a number of other roadways around the area that I've worked on. And it's, it's always a nice remember, reminder when I go through them of the challenges of that project, but also like the reward to really see it out there and how our projects have kind of changed what the community around them kind of how they use the road, how they use the sidewalks, all of that, um, but also kind of the look and feel of the neighborhoods, how they can change. Yeah, it must be a really good sense of fulfillment to kind of see that you're impacting positively, impacting communities, and you can actually see that change. So, oh yeah, absolutely. It, it's kind of, kind of amazing, and one of those two that when you're looking at plans all day, sometimes you don't notice how much that when this is implement, implemented, it really will change how things are out there. Yeah. So and this is gonna be a hard question probably to answer, but, but what type of person do you think would actually thrive and, and be happy and succeed um, in transportation engineering? So um, as I mentioned before, I think the biggest thing is having a love of problem solving. It is just, thing after thing that you look at, no design is simple, nothing is just you can cookie cutter everything, um, just drop in the same design here, there, and everywhere. Every road is different. You really have to look at it and take a step back and think things through. So it's, uh, and then as I mentioned, solve each problem as they come up. Um, some of the longer lead times on projects, as I mentioned, so you have to have some patience with those, but then also you'll have other projects that are going to move more quickly than you could imagine. Um, especially, uh, there's different project delivery systems that are out there now, including design build projects where uh, we team with a contractor and as a result, we are designing it and as soon as we're done with our design, they're out there building it. So some of those projects really just push the timeline, it's shorter, it's high pressure, but also um, kind of enjoyable because you get to see the results of your work even faster. So I think you have to be flexible from project to project as well, um, but you're going to have some that we're going to move really quickly, some that'll take their time. Um, so you just have to kind of be ready for anything. That's really interesting. So you go from from waiting 12 years to see your design to waiting days <laughs> to, to see them start to construct. So that so really there's people that kind of can go with the flow either way um, with those problem solvings. Sounds like it'd be interesting for them. Well, thanks, Mike. That has been really interesting. I think I've learned a lot about transportation engineer. There's a lot of different aspects of it. It sounds like there's a lot of different things um, that you can be doing in transportation engineering. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, Lana. This is really enjoyable for me too. Those people that are listening to us, if there's another engineering topic you'd like to have a webinar on to find out more about that engineering career, just email us at info at repicture.com. Okay, thanks everyone.